imaging, helicopters, FBI's been there. They've had thousands of people volunteering, and not a single clue. Mm -hmm. This may be inappropriate at this time, but I just remember Tom asking me to bring some WEI cards. Okay. I ran it back here from this table. All right. She didn't tell me about the program. Okay. Really good lesson last week. Yes. Really enjoyed listening to him. I'm ready to study other time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for being able to be here this morning for your blessings and mercy and grace and salvation through Jesus. We're just countless blessings that we wake up to every day. Help us to look around us and see all the need that is out there and uh, to use the blessings that you've given us to help take care of other people and to spread your word. And as we read this chapter 13, and uh, that's exactly what's happening is your word is being spread and your plan is uh, in place. And we pray that we are looking at our lives as uh, a part of that story and that plan. Pray for Tom's recovery and for... Uh, Anita and Tommy and Susan and everyone who's um, working to help take care of him and his needs and we just pray for his strength, um, pray for Sawyer and his family as he's been missing for a week and um, just that uh, something can come from that. Um, also for uh, Nikki's brother and his wife as they have uh, come down with COVID and pray for their quick recovery and strength and your healing. For uh, everyone in our body who has um, weakness, sickness, illness, spiritual, physical, however that's manifesting itself, we pray your hands on them and for us to minister to them. We're thankful for the opportunity to be here to worship you today. We pray that that is a blessing that will lift your name up and that we will be lifted up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, let me get this a little. How's the volume? Good? Good? Okay. What do you remember? About last week, we're in our second week of Acts 13. Anything that stands out to you from what we talked about last week that you think about? I've got some hints on the screen for you. We're in Antioch. Why are we in Antioch? Why is the church in Antioch? Say that one more time. They were first called Christians in Antioch, right? And yeah, and why are they there? Because they've been driven out of Jerusalem. People have lost their ability to worship in Jerusalem. They've been driven out. Now they're in Antioch. What type of a city is Antioch? multicultural, and you can see that in the leadership of the church there in Antioch. You have eth different ethnicities, um, and that city, uh, you, you know, we think about our state of culture today in, in our country, and it bothers us and gets us down, and pagan followers there in Antioch. Um, because there's lots of cultures, what does that mean about spirituality and beliefs and the way people live? Mm-hmm. 
Yes, a lot of different beliefs. So you've got this um, culture where there's a mixture of the East and the West. So what comes from the East? What kinds of things do you think about when you think about Eastern culture? Mysticism. Spiritual, but pretty broad sense of the word spiritual, you know. What do you think of when you think of the West in spirituality? More focused on the God we know, and that's true today. And that's what they have coming through this city because it's a port city. There's a lot of trade coming through there. So there's a lot of different cultures. And in this chapter, we see a man who is Jewish, but he's also um, involved in sorcery. And that's just a mixture of influences and people thinking, oh, well, you know, I, that seems, I can see some good things in that. And so, you know, and that gets, that happens today with people. You see that in our culture where we get this blend of a lot of different things that people believe. And you think, oh, well, you know, that doesn't seem bad. Hmm. That seems interesting. Maybe I could get something from that. And then it becomes part of their belief system. And you get syncretism is a word that is a mixture of a lot of beliefs pulled together. I pull this. I like this out of that that belief. You know, I think I'm going to apply that to my life. And I like this out of Buddhism, you know, and this out of Christianity. And none of it's really... I mean, I can use all of that and just kind of have my own belief system. And that's what a lot of our culture does today. Um, I mean, I've seen books and teaching that are related to Buddhism and Christianity and how we're pulling together some of the you know positives out of those two things and what can we take from that. And you just see a lot of confusion. And so... This, in chapter 13 here, is where we get to the, you know, Paul's ministry really takes off. So some people would kind of call this the Acts of Paul because be from when you, this is Paul, really, a lot of the New Testament from here on. And we'll see that he's really covering a lot of ground. The church is very led by the Spirit. What does it tell us right there in the beginning verses of Acts chapter 13? What are those people doing? Worshiping and fasting. fasting. That could kind of be a clue for us of some basic things that we should do. And when that, that word fasting, what's another word that's used in some other translations? Did I say worshiping or did I say fasting? What worshiping is the word I meant to say? What, <laughs> as I said that, I thought, did I say the wrong word? So, what are some other words that worshiping is used in some other translations? Okay, praying goes along with that. Ministering is the word I'm thinking of. Some translations say that they were ministering to the Lord. So, last week we talked about this. What should your worship be? Up. So, yes, it's, there's edifying, and, but the focus is up. And ministering to the Lord means, if you relate that back to Old Covenant time, relating parallel to New Covenant time, What's going up? And what is our sacrifice now? Us, right? Sacrificing ourselves, that's going up. That's a blessing to the Lord. What did David, go ahead. Glorifying. Glorifying. That's part of the first thing. It's not glorifying. Yep. What, whenever that sacrifice would go up, what's one of the things that we think about that they would describe it as what to the... 
sweet smelling. You know, so think about your worship. Is that, is God getting that from you in your worship? Oh, such a blessing. To think about all of the people across the world worshiping. Exactly. That's a conversation with God because God knows everything on our hearts, everything we can't express. And it's a missional church. So when I say this is a missional church, what happens immediately right here in the beginning of this chapter? Well, they're led by the Spirit, and what do they immediately do? Send out Paul and Barnabas. Now, did the church send out Paul and Barnabas? Who sent out Paul and Barnabas? Led by the Spirit. So the Spirit did. And so when we think about that Antioch church, they're really focusing on their purpose. So think about us if, you know, we're praying and we're worshiping and we're fasting and we really kind of start to get the message that somebody needs to go do this and leave here. It would be like if we said, you know what, I, Mark and Tommy are being called to go somewhere else, and we're not going to worry about whether or not we can cover Sunday morning services. Somebody else can get up and talk here on Sunday morning, but they need to go do this. There's no hesitation, because we're not looking at, well, what's... What are things going to look like for me now here? Because I want to hear a good sermon on Sunday, and I want to like the speaker. And it's yeah, it's not about me. So think about that in relation to our consumer versus missional church. Our, our culture is very consumer in terms of church. Because what are we in? What are we thinking about when we choose where to go worship? How is it going to make me feel? Uh, are they going to have the programs that I need? Are there going to be the things there that I'm going to really get something out of? Do they sing the songs that I like? Yeah, how can I serve you? Yeah, and that's the difference. Yeah, that's the difference we're pointing out is are you consume, is our church consumer or missional? And uh, I mentioned this last week, I was listening to, I like, to, there's a guy named Skip Heitzig that I really like. He teaches out in Santa Fe, New Mexico, I think. And he said, you know, maybe this particular Sunday I was a little tired or I don't know, but a, some, a couple was visiting and after the service they asked him, so what do you offer here at your church? And his reply was, well, what do you offer? <laughs> and that's what we have to be thinking about. Can I go in and serve and help and do something for that group of people rather than what am I going to go get out of it? Um, and also something that stuck out to me thinking about uh, this group of people is later in the chapter, in the 25th chapter, verse 8, the Jews are frustrated and they make the statement that you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and they're tired of it. You have to think about is our body is our church is the word being spread and fill, filling the community where we're at the city where we're at to where people who 
aren't Christians that don't want to hear the word, that are against the word, would say, I'm tired of hearing about Jesus. And that's the way the Jews felt at times. And so, look at this list. This is the, all the cities, Paul's three missionary journeys. These are all the places he hit. It's just kind of astounding to think about on foot, I don't know where I'm going to sleep next. I don't know where my next meal is coming from, but I'm sent out by the Spirit. I'm led by the Spirit. And uh, I mean, it's just astounding when you look at this list of all the places that he went and taught. And uh, so it really speaks to us. Um, When you think about the fact that the Word has now left the kind of village culture of Palestine and moved into a Greco-Roman culture. What are some of the advantages of that? Okay. Okay, so that culture likes for you to give them logic and reason. And another thing that sticks out to me is the fact that there's a lot of different cultures. And what does that, what's, how does that fit into God's plan? If I teach in a culture where there's a lot of different diverse backgrounds and there's a lot of commerce and travel spreads, if I'm teaching in more of a village type culture, the culture in that community is being touched, but they're not necessarily going anywhere. This is a group of people where he's going, those people are going all over the place. And so that helps to spread the word rapidly because they're going different places. Antioch is a port city. You know, you're going to see that they get on a sailboat and they go sail off to the next location. And so there's travel and that matters because then you're touching a lot of people. So This is all happening within a decade of Jesus' crucifixion. The word spreads so rapidly within Paul's missionary journeys that it covers more than it had ever covered up to that point. In a very short time, the word explodes and spreads. So he's going to go... um, and, and Barnabas is going to go, and they're going to go out and be sent. And I think that this also points to the fact that God is a missional God. And when we think about back to a, uh, Genesis 12 and Abraham, what did God call Abraham to do? Just go, leave home. And go to a place he did not know. Yep. And then what did Jesus say? He has been, he'd been sent, right? And now Paul chose an instrument. And that's what he's doing. He's fulfilling that. When we think about diversity of backgrounds, um, that also for me says to me that God's for everyone. There's no, you know, the Jews were that chosen original people to take the message, to be taught all of the things that they needed to be taught, to have the prophecies 
to understand the difference between God and man and have that connection and then to go out. But the word is for everyone. And the, the, uh, the role of the Jews was to do what? Mm -hmm. So there's no differentiation. Yeah, the only real, um, but he gave kind of, he gave an order though of to go to who first? Go to the Jews first. What do we see Paul do every single time he gets to the next place? Goes to the synagogue. If you weren't Thinking about that and aware of that, what might you mistake that for? Well, I'm going to where I'm comfortable. I know people, I'm going to... But that wasn't what was going on. He was going there because each one of those times, he's giving the, them the opportunity to hear and to take advantage of what they know, what they should know, and, and do something with it. So they are sent on their way by the Holy Spirit and they go to the Jewish synagogue and who's with them as their helper? John, also called Mark. And so we're going to hear about him later. He is Barnabas' nephew or cousin. Nephew. Barnabas' nephew. And uh, what's the story here that's going to unfold with him? He's young. He turns back. We don't know why, but he's young. Uh, maybe that means he's a teenager. We don't know. Imagine your teenager going off with a couple grown men, traveling, going to different places. What happens with him? We don't know. Maybe he gets homesick. Um, one thing that we see here in the way this plays out is that... Uh, When you read when they're being sent out, Barnabas' name is listed first. It says Barnabas and Paul are sent. What ends up happening with Barnabas? Kind of falls into the background, doesn't he? Not that he didn't go on and teach and go travel and go places and do things, but he doesn't have the, he doesn't end up having that leadership role that Paul does. Maybe that bothered Mark. That's his uncle. Maybe he didn't necessarily, maybe he wanted to follow his uncle and not necessarily take direction from Paul. Maybe there's a personality difference. We don't have any idea. Here in Acts, um, when we get to the point where he departs from them, Luke is very gracious about the way he writes he doesn't make it sound like anything happened. He just states facts. He departed. He left. Now, when Paul talks about it, the wording that he uses, the translation of the same word, his uh, frame of reference is to say he deserted us. He ran away. And he's very irritated about it. But we don't really get a whole lot of anything here other than the fact that, all right, so he's with them as their helper. They travel throughout this whole island and they meet this Jewish sorcerer 
and false prophet. And uh, he was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. A proconsul is like a governor. So who else do we know that's a governor in this region? Who's a famous name that we're going to talk about in the story of Jesus who's a governor? Pilate's a governor. Pilate was appointed by Caesar. The, this type of governor is appointed by the Senate. So where they're located at right now is a like a senatorial province. So it has just a little bit of a different form of government. Did you ever watch um, Gladiator, the movie Gladiator? What was the point of that movie? What was the dream or the wish of the uh, the uh, Roman, uh, the Caesar? He wanted to return Rome back to the people, to a uh, to the Senate, to have the representative government. So this little area here has a representative type of government. And so they're both governors. It's just a different term. So we have this man who's Jewish and he's a sorcerer. That seems like a real, doesn't make sense, does it? In, if he were in Jerusalem, what could happen to him? What's that, Wayne? They'd kill him. They'd stone him. So you see the difference in the culture of where we're at now versus Jerusalem. A lot of different, that's ah, okay, no big deal. You know, a lot of different thoughts, and, and that's very much like culture we live in today, isn't it? Pretty much whatever you want to believe, your truth. Yeah, to each your own. Your, it's your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth, whatever. So... When we think and we worry about, oh, such a decline, how long ago was this? That, I mean, it's the same thing over and over and over again. So he's a false prophet. He's mixing Judaism with other belief systems. And... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, he's... When you're not driven by God ruling your life completely, what other kinds of things can rule your life? Anything. anything else, right? So that's another one of those challenges of mixing different beliefs is you don't have a true focus because I'm kind of... I'm taking what matters to me and what I believe and how I feel. And so, yes, he is uh, interested in making money. Um, and Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit, does what? Yeah, and when we think of being filled with the Holy Spirit, do we usually think about yelling at people and confronting them? And No. <laughs> you know, we're usually thinking about worship and being led by the Spirit. And, you know, we see it as a peaceful thing, not confronting somebody. But what did Jesus do? Same thing. Yeah, that's a good point because that's what we've got going on here. 
is being pulled apart by two different masters. And so, you know, Paul is doing what the Spirit is leading him to do. And he is very, um, he does not hold back his tongue in saying what he says to him. He says, calls him a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. Um, and what does, he, he blinds him, which is really ironic because Paul was blinded. And so, what is that, uh, what happens when you lose all of your ability and you're reduced down to having very little ability to depend on yourself? Yeah, you realize your helplessness. Yeah, you almost disappear. That's a good point. Yeah. Do you think Paul chose this curse, or do you think the Spirit chose the curse and used it? Probably so. Probably the Spirit. And knowing that, and we don't know, but knowing what Paul had been through just seems like perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we could look at that two different ways and say, well, you know, wow, that does make sense. And the Spirit is telling me to do this or the Spirit's leading me and this is the curse that I'm going to put on this person because of the impact that made on me. Because I lost all of my ability to depend on myself. <clears throat> Yeah. Really and uh, this is a miracle uh, the governor believes and you know that that door is going to spread like wildfire yeah. to people so this is you know, the spirit works powerful yeah, and just who, would, who would pick a, a magician like that a con man to blind to spread the word yeah I, again you know, I'm thinking about this culture that they're in, how many people that would impact when this proconsul believes because of the sign that he's just seen, how many people are going to know about that from talking to him beyond this point, how many people he's going to touch because of that. So we just really see um, the spirit at work and uh, using Paul and... Um, I just quickly, you know, when you think about Paul, what are some of the things that you think about in terms of him as a person, the human? What do you think about? In that persecution, and then in what he does after that, after he's changed, what does that make you think about as a person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully dedicated. Yeah, very strong convictions. 
Yeah, he did. He severely, sincerely wanted the truth. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Now that you said that, he sincerely wanted the truth. Think about yourself. So, for us to really desire the truth, what do you have to do in your own life? You have, you have to really be seeking it. You have to own it. I think that's a great point because you can grow up and your faith be your parents' faith and you not really own it. At some point, you have to own your own faith. Yeah, humility is a, is a great trait. Yeah. Yeah, he had to truly believe that he was forgiven. Yeah. And there's a part of you that even knowing that you're forgiven, I think the worst that you believe that you did prior to being forgiven, probably the more it propels you forward to work to get away from that and to influence other people. And, you know, Paul is very motivated and uh, yeah, I read so really I mean we don't have any pictures of anybody from Bible times but there was a, a man in the second century who had some knowledge of Paul from personal experience with people who met him described him and this is a writing from the second century described him as a small man with a large nose, who was bald, built, strongly built, um, full of grace, and at times looked like he had the face of an angel. Um, that's the way somebody described him who had the opportunity to interact with him at, you know, in his life. This is writing from the second century um, so, you know, I, th I always think about Paul as being willing to die for what he believed in. And when we get here to the sermon that he gives, he gets the opportunity to go to the synagogue. And one of the things that's a practice in the synagogue is they have their reading. And then... If someone is there who is a visitor who can speak, hey, we would like to have you get up and give us a word. We'd like to hear from you, you know, read this passage, read this, like we saw Jesus get up and read a scroll and reveal who he was. Well, Paul's visiting a synagogue. There's probably some knowledge of who Paul is. And so they want him to get up and speak. And he does something that's called historical retrospection. And this is a Jewish tradition. So when you think about oral history, 
What's the value in going back and telling stories? You don't forget. Yeah, that's, that's a, a, one of the great benefits. What else can you think of that you would get from this? What's that? Oh, okay. I mean, that uh-huh. I guess also another thing is remembering what's been done for you and where you came from. Yeah, when you remember what's been done for you and where you came from, then what does that do for you at the time that you're in, living in now and your future? It, it does serve as a guide. It's, also truth. it's truth. And what does that, that sets it in your heart. You can live on that. If I think about, and we go back and recount stories of all of the things that God has done for our people and everything that he's led us through, and I'm living in today and I'm going through a challenge or I have something difficult to face, Well, look at what God's done before. And so they tell these stories. This is a tradition for them to go back, and it's a reminder. And that is very built into their culture because, you know, they want their children to grow up knowing God has been with us and led us through. And you'll need to know at times in your life that God's going to lead you through something. But look at what he's done before. So that's what Paul uses that in this sermon. And he does exactly the same. It's just what they're used to doing. So now what does he do that they're not expecting? He talks about how you miss Jesus in this. So he goes back through and talks about them, um, you know, God leading their people through the wilderness, the 450 years, God gave them judges, and then the people asked for, the, for a king. He didn't want them to have a king, but they asked for a king, so he gave them a king. He gave them Saul, and then he brings it down to who that they really revere, David. And so then he's going to tie all of this into Everything that's been leading up to this, everything that has been prophesied, that has come to pass. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before Jesus came, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. And as John was completing his work, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not the one. No, but he is coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Now, you know, something that is interesting, I've got a couple minutes left here. They're pretty receptive to what Paul's saying. You know, you read that, uh, let's see, what verse are we in here? That some of the devout Jews followed them and the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. Many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now what happens the very next Sabbath? Most of the city showed up. To hear. And what did that do to the Jews? 
made them jealous. I mean, they're so wrapped up in being in charge. That has overwhelmed them to the point where they can't hear the truth. They're more worried about me. And so they start to revolt against them, talk abusively against them. And Paul and Barnabas said, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And the Gentiles are thrilled. And they want to hear. They're hungry to hear. And they're open And the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. What's the shaking of the dust signify? It's on you. We did what we came here to do. The responsibility is on you now. We're pulling away from having relationship with you. And they go 80 miles away. Yes, John. I don't know that I, I don't know that I would say that it is a curse. I can't say that I know that. I think that you know Mark could spend all of his time with one person and teach and teach and teach and try to be an example to them to pull them out of bad circumstances over and over again and at some point say It's beyond what I'm going to do and can do, and it's on you. And if I continue, I'm really wasting my time. There are other people who want to hear this message, and I'm shaking the dust off, and I'm moving on and planting my feet somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Exactly. And so they move on 80 miles away to Iconium, and I love the last verse. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. They're excited. They're ready to keep moving on and teaching. And um, the Gentile world is going to spread the the gospel. And it's going to spread fast. So that is all the time we have. Thank you.
here this morning. Let's go ahead and start our worship with singing. Let's stand as we sing together. <clears throat> you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Jesus, you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up and be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom. shall be strong in purpose and in unity, declaring a loud praise and glory, wisdom. singing this morning. We'll sing Shield About Me next. 
Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my hand. be seated. Good morning. Oh, that was kind of poor. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. There we go. That was in honor of George, okay? So, hope George is watching. That was for you, George. Oh, is he? <laughs> well, you were watching, weren't you? I'm sorry, George. I looked right over you. <laughs> How you feeling? I'm glad you're feeling with compliment. Thank you. Let's read our scripture this morning. Um, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Let's pray. Our Lord and Father, 
we come to you this morning acknowledging you as our creator, acknowledging you as our savior, acknowledging you as the designer of life as we know it. Father, as we live in the world today, we don't see everything the way you designed it to be in the beginning. But we know, Father, that you are with us and your kingdom is present here with us. I am so thankful, Father, for the body of Arlington that we members here um, worship you. It, and, and the numbers here this morning is exciting to see, especially during a time of recent uh, pandemic and recent uh, issues in the world around us that seem to grow. You, the it appears in other ways from a world view that the world is changing the truth changing towards you we pray and the thrill of living and life in them because they are part of your kingdom and they know the truth. Father, I lift up to you today, members of our congregation, our family and friends who need you in their lives at this, this time. Thank you so much that George is here with us this morning. And it was so, it's so wonderful to have people feels possibly weaker but you father have him i thank you for dr drennan and the successful surgery that occurred this week that he is on his way to recovery and that his memory of 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 teaching exists and lives on here in arlington and father we pray for his family as they serve him we pray father for many others in our body that we know have struggles and we want to lift them up as well you know who they are and we know you have them father i also want to include those people around the world who are being persecuted right now especially focus upon the folks in Ukraine as they live through several atrocities that are occurring to their people and their land. We pray, Father, that you be with them, that you continue to give them the courage and the bravery, and you continue to give them the um, opportunity to fight against what is wrong, to fight for what is life. Father, we pray for the governments around the world as decisions are made around the activities surrounding these, this war and other things. We pray that they become more like-minded in the kingdom and that they fight for life and right and good. We know, Father, that in the end, you are in control of all of these and that in the end, we as part of your kingdom will see a day in heaven with you glorifying you, praising you, worship you, singing these praises as we sing today to you. We ask all of these things in our loving Savior's name. Amen. Let's continue our worship with Hide Me Away, O Lord. 
Hide me away, O oh Lord. Hide me away, O oh Lord. In the day of trouble, neath the shadow of your wings, hide me away, O oh Lord. Give me your peace, O oh Lord. Before we take communion together, let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. To help prepare ourselves for our Lord's Supper, our communion this morning, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord that which is also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow as I lead us in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we come for you now, thanking you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for that sacrifice he did for us on that cross of Calvary. Heavenly Father, we're sorry that he had to do that for us because we're such a sinful people, and we often do say and do things that are they're hurtful to you, but thank you for the love that you showed us that you sent him to be an example for us. As we take this bread, we remember what Jesus has done for us. In his name we pray. Heavenly Father, as we hold this little cup here, a little bit of <laughs> reminding what we're reminding what Jesus has done for us. Heavenly Father, we all only do this about once a week, but we need to remember every day and thankful to you that what that sacrifice he did. Sometimes we don't realize what it is that gives give your life. And he was a perfect sacrifice for all of us, Heavenly Father. May we take it this remembrance of him, in Jesus' name. Amen. That's the offering plate like we used to. We have a uh, box in the back if you want to... Uh, uh, to give there, and of course we have online giving. But something to think about, I read one time, and we're so blessed in this country, and God has blessed us so much, that most of the people in the world only have one set of clothes, and that's the clothes they're wearing at that time. And I think about, Jennifer and I have separate closets. <laughs> and I go in this morning, and I had to try to pick out the shirt I was going to wear, and I have a closet full of shirts and a lot of us are the same way you know so every time when you can't decide what you want to wear think about those poor people who don't have much of anything um i don't know just something to think about there um and uh as a close here today let's uh let's pray uh, and think about those things heavenly father Thank you for those things you have blessed us with. Thank you for blessing us so much in this country for everything that we have. May we be good stewards of what you've given us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for... Also, again, for Jesus, we thank you for the example and the love that he showed for us. In these, we pray through his name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's great to see everybody today. A couple of quick announcements. Right after worship, um, right up front, we're going to have a quick vacation Bible school meeting. Jason McDougall is here, and he's going to uh, get everybody together and figure out, make sure our time is best for families. So parents of kids, if you would also stay, and anybody interested in helping this year with VBS, they'll be right after our worship. Also, next Sunday is Fourth Sunday Fellowship, which means food, potluck. So come prepared for that. We're also going to honor our lone high school graduate this year, Lexi Price. So we look forward to doing that. And also today at 2 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall is a baby shower for Meredith, Meredith Rowland. So excited about that. Um, all right. I think I got through all of that. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 is a passage that I was reflecting on some this week. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your what? Own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Boy, the times we get into trouble when we lean on our own understanding instead of God's understanding. As we've been talking about the mind, the renewal of the mind, and how important it is to think about what we think about, how we are so easily deceived, and we believe lies of the enemy. Things like, I'm a failure, and I'm no good, and just give up, and... Um, 
it is complex, isn't it? Because our brains are very complex. So we've been kind of journeying through how to replace lies with truth and declaring that truth from God's word as who we are, as his creation. And today, um, I want us to continue to think about that in light of the lenses that we look through in life. Linda Bateman shared with me the following quote that she heard. The mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. And I think that is so true. Um, Robin Sharma, by the way, shared that. Stan, I think I have the slide for that. Um, maybe the next one. Yeah, there it is. Um, you know, we can use our minds for good, can't we? And wonderful things that we can accomplish for God with our minds. But, oh, man, when things get into our minds that are twisted and distorted, and you think about what's happening today, like in Ukraine, because of a twisted mind in Putin. I know many of the Russian people do not want this war. And there are many soldiers who are saying they're, they're giving up, they're walking away. Um, but when you have somebody like that, who is just going to push their way through, it's horrible. And terrible things happen. You've probably heard the phrase, looking through rose-colored glasses. I brought my matrix glasses today for me to wear. Now, you all look pretty dark right now, okay? And there are other glasses you can put on that make everything look yellow or bright or rose-colored. And it changes reality. You have to take them off to get back to what's true, what's real. But when you look through rose-colored glasses, so think about the lenses we look at our world, uh, the way we see people. The way at them properly with proper perception, then we're going to end up making some mistakes, uh, treating people wrongly, thinking of ourselves in a negative way. So let's say that you enter the friend of a, uh, you're going to a party with a friend. So let's just say that um, George and I, uh, I, I tell George, George, I want you to go with me to this, uh, this party we're going to have. Uh, I got some friends from church coming together and people that know you. But before we go in, I need to tell you something. They think you're a jerk. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that, but nobody there really likes you. But, but come on, let's go. Let's go have fun. Well, obviously, he's going to be, well, what? So he goes into the party, and sure enough, the hostess doesn't greet George. So what does George think? Well, no wonder. She thinks I'm a jerk. And then he looks over in the corner, and there are two people laughing, looking at each other, telling a story and laughing. And you know what George thinks? They're talking about me. I know they are. They're, they're thinking about me. And then another person comes up to you and says, I'm out of here. I'm out of this party. And George says, they're leaving because I'm here. I just got here and now they're leaving. So George decides, enough of this. I, I'm, I'm not going to take any more of it. So he tells his friend, I'm out of here. And his friend says, did you believe that whole thing I told you that everybody thinks you're a jerk? And George says, what do you mean? And he says, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Nobody thinks George was a jerk, but when that seed was planted in his mind, it changed his perception on everything that was going on. Folks, this happens all the time. It happens all the time. We don't even realize it. We believe something that's not true in the way we view everything around us. It's, it's faulty. So we really need to think about this. Um, psychologists actually have a name for the the distorted lens that we sometimes see things through. And it's called cognitive bias. Cognitive bias. This describes a consistent pattern of deviating from reality in how we see and process things. The reality you construct will then dictate how you respond and behave in the world, even though it's not actual reality. Now, that's pretty scary, isn't it? When you, when you really stop to think about that. Uh, here's an example for you. So a boss calls in two employees. He tells each employee the same thing. It's some constructive criticism, okay, and how they can do their job better. Now, the first employee walks away thinking to himself, wow, that, that was really good advice. I could see some things in what they told me that would really improve my performance and I will do a better job as an employee for this company, and maybe they'll be reflected on a, a pay increase down the road. 
So that's, that's one person. Guess what? The second person who heard those exact same words, you know what they thought? What a jerk. My boss has no idea how many hours I'm putting in, what I'm doing, and all they have to say is how bad of a job I'm doing? Well, I'll show him by how I work. Is that not amazing? The exact same thing, but you're looking at it through a different lens, from a different perspective. Um, cognitive bias is real, and it can impact your relationship with God. Uh, I remember back when I was in youth ministry, and I remember one young lady who met with me, and she was really having a hard time comprehending that God is loving and that God really cared about her. And I thought, okay, there's something going on here. There's something beneath the surface that is causing her to view God this way. So we began to peel back the onion. And it took some time, but she revealed to me that she was being abused by her father. Well, no wonder she was having a hard time thinking of God as being loving and being relational and being kind because of that, what she was dealing with. Um, you know, somebody else I talk to who is, feels great about God. I've got such a close walk with God, and I'm journeying with God, and you ask that person, what's your relationship like with your parents? I've got a great relationship with my parents. It's amazing how our background, our past, the situations we encounter, what we go through, it influences us in our perception of reality. Um, now, we see cognitive bias in others more than we do ourselves. This is why we have to constantly think about what we think about. So we need to think about our own biases and how that blocks us from being all that God wants us to be. Here's an ex a couple of examples for you. Signs of cognitive bias. Only tuning into news and stories that confirm your opinions. Now, you have an opinion about something. That is your bias, okay? Why do you have that bias? Well, maybe it's because that's all you're listening to. That's all you're hearing. Um, it's good to open up our minds to the other side. That's why we have juries in a court of law where both sides, the defense and the prosecution, presents. I was talking to a friend of mine this week who was on a jury recently, and he was telling me that you know, when the, the de defense got up, or the I can't remember which one it was, but whichever presented first, Nikki, what presents first? The, the prosecution came first, presented the case, and my buddy thought, well, this is slam dunk. I mean, absolutely, the guy did it. And then the defense got up, and guess what? Painted a completely different picture and changed the perspective. Um, so this happens, and it's important to listen to both sides of the story. How about always assuming you are correct? You ever met somebody that they're always correct? I mean, they're never wrong, okay? That can be a bias, and you have to say, why, why is that about me? Why do I always think that I'm right or I have to have my way? There, there's a reason for that, but guess what? You are not always correct. Uh, quite often you're wrong. Attributing other people's success to luck. This is somebody who probably feels like they're not very lucky. They're not very blessed. So they just assume if somebody else got the promotion ahead of them, well, they're just lucky, you know, it, or how about constantly blaming others if things don't go your way? Or assuming that everyone else shares the same opinions or beliefs. These are cognitive biases, examples. Now here's one I'll share, I'll get personal with you. I, mean, I try to do this in these lessons to show you how your preacher struggles in these areas of the mind. But one of the big illusions that we sometimes have is control. We would like to believe that we are in control of things. In some ways, I am a control freak. Um, for example, the remote control. Guess in my house, who holds that? When I'm home, boys hand it over, okay? Now sometimes I'll give it to them, but, but I'm, I would like to watch what I wanna watch. Uh, driving, guess who does most of the driving when Christine and I are in the car? I do. You're right, you guessed it. And if I'm riding with you, I would be happy to drive your car for you. <laughs> and if I'm not driving your car for you, I will let you know how you are driving. 
Okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Planning vacations, guess who does that? I do. And then I'm happy to share with the family what we're gonna do, okay? This is gonna be a great trip, the best trip we have. Listen, this was painful this week to do this. And I pull in my assignment at the end is going to be find somebody who loves you that you can say, what is it? What is a bias I have that I can't see myself? And I bounce this off Christine, and she was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you, again, you're not, being, you're not being critical. We want to be careful. We are, when you open yourself up to someone, let's be careful how we confirm that, okay? But yeah, these, these are tough things. Um, the problem with control is that it really is an illusion. Now, that's not to say that there are some things we are in control of. We are. Our attitude is so important, our work ethic, I could go on, but there are are truly things that are beyond our control, like the pandemic, right? I mean, March, two years ago, when all that happened, it seemed like that, when everything shut down, we never saw that coming. Um, The housing market and what that that has done here in Knoxville the last year, where prices have basically doubled, none of us saw that happening. And if it did, we all would have bought houses, (laughs) right, and made some bucks beforehand. Um, I mean, I could go on. D- accidents that take place. Tom Drennan falling and breaking his hip. Okay? Outside of his control, it happened. These things happen. Um, our health. You know, one day we're feeling good. And we start feeling bad. You know, we push it off for a few weeks going to the doctor. We go and we, we get the bad news. Okay? Unpredictable outside of our control. In fact, think a lot of things in the past were beyond our control that affected us. A lot of things in the future are beyond our control. But here is the good news in regards to that. There is something you are in control of, and that is how you deal with what happens. Are you following me? That is how you interact um, with what takes place. Psychologists have a name for this. It's called cognitive reframing. It is like a picture frame. The frame sets apart what that picture is. And in our minds, we can reframe whatever has taken place for God's glory, to recognize that God is in control and God is there. Um, So here's an example of cognitive restructuring or reframing. Let's say that, and I know this is hard to see, so I'll try to read it for you. Let's say that the event is you made an error at your new job and you were asked to correct it. Well, a negative reframing, okay, is I'm a failure. I messed up already. Here it is a new job, and I messed up again. Uh, My boss hates me, probably is going to fire me. I should quit. I am useless and stupid. Folks, there's a lot of people that this is what happens to them, okay? The consequence, reduced job effort, as pointless, quit the job, or fail the job, or move deeper into depression. Or, okay, the other side, a functional thought, you know what, I need to fix that. Yeah, I messed up, everybody messes up, okay? Uh, I need to check the labels next time. I can be successful at this job. I will be successful at this job. Consequence, increased effort, better performance, success, elevated esteem. Okay, this is how this works, this cognitive reframing. So here's some steps that you can take. And or actually, I've got one more example for you for the kids that are out there. Uh, here is a way for you kids to think about it. So you need to stop the thought that you're having. Remember, in the mind, these thoughts are constantly coming in. This is too hard. I can't do it. No, you need to reframe that. This may take time and hard work, but you know what? I can do it. Or how about I'm bad at this? No, I want to get better at this. Or I don't want to, I don't want to do this. It makes me nervous. Instead of that, I can try. I'll use the strategies I learned to calm down and to relax. Or this was the worst day ever. You know, it wasn't that bad. I, tomorrow, it's going to be better. Nobody likes me. That's silly. Lots of kids have played with me. Or I made a mistake. Well, you know, mistakes can actually help me learn better. So kids, okay, this is how it's done. 
Now, here's some practical steps for you with some biblical passages to back it up. And if you went to a good psychologist, they'd probably tell you these as well. Um, Number one, stay calm. When a situation happens, a bad thing happens to us, instead of overreacting, take a breath. My, my mom used to, I don't know if it was my mom or my dad, take a chill pill, okay? Just take a chill pill, Mark, okay? Slow down, it's okay, don't overreact. Sometimes it's helpful to take a walk. Uh, Greg and Delenda, I remember the class you guys just did with us. Um, when the discussion gets heated, the blood pressure goes up, the face starts to turn red. The best thing you can do is tell each other, we need a break. Let's just take a few minutes, We'll come back together. It doesn't mean you ignore the situation, but I, I just need a little bit of time. And give that to each other. A passage I like here is James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. That is so true. Slow down. Number two, identify the situation. Really try to step back and say, okay, what's happening right now? I know I think this is what's happening, but it could be wrong, okay? Then that's where humility needs to come into the equation, that I don't have maybe the best way of looking at it. I don't have the answers. I'm not always right. Identify the situation. We can get so caught up in a worldly mindset that we forget that our lives are actually hidden in Christ. I love this passage in Colossians 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Have a heavenly mindset, a mindset set above. Why? Why do we do that? I've heard some people say, you know, you can have such a heavenly mindset that you're no earthly good. Um, But the people I know who are focused on the kingdom of heaven, both the kingdom to come, the ultimate reality of the kingdom, and the kingdom here that's breaking into the world, the people that have their mind on the kingdom are people who accomplish much. Okay, They do amazing things in this life. For God. That's why Satan is trying to distort our minds. He's trying to feed us lies. The devil does not want us to put our mind on things above. He wants us to put our minds on earthly things, the here and now. That's why what Paul is primarily, I think, referring to here in Colossians. How about Matthew? Matthew 6, 10 through 9 through 10, um, where Jesus is talking about prayer, the Lord's Prayer. And he taught to not be consumed with God's name being, or to think about God's name being hallowed, and his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The believer's mind should be consumed with heavenly things. Point number three, identify your automatic thoughts. Identify your automatic thoughts. Um, Stanley, there it is, thank you. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we demolish arguments, And every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedience to Christ. You've heard me quote this now probably the third time in these lessons because it's so important. Taking our thoughts captive. Um, So in a moment of frustration, like your car breaking down. Anybody have that happen recently? Okay, isn't that a wonderful experience? Because you always have time for your car to break down, right? Oh, what do you do with that moment of, oh, okay? One, one reaction is, there it goes again. God's out to get me, okay? Why does my life stink? Why does it, oh, it never happens to him by us? Why is it me? That's one way to look at it. Or the other way to look at it is identifying again those, those automatic thoughts that come. You know, I'm not going to turn to a destructive habit right now because of my frustration and anger. I'm not going to pull out that bag of Oreos from the back seat and consume them all right now, okay? I'm not going to go to the bar and just get loaded. I'm not going to go, you know what I'm saying, those things that we do because we're those thoughts that we get. 
We've got to be careful. We've got to capture the thoughts, make it obedient to Christ. And that leads to the final step, number four. Find objective, supportive evidence. Find subjective, supportive evidence. In order to stay in reality, you look for things to hold on to that are objective. Here's a way to do that. Back to the breaking down of the car example. Yeah, the car broke down. Man, I'm sure glad I got AAA. By the way, I've got AAA. You know why? Because I was sick and tired of the car breaking down and having no way other than calling friends from church to, to pull me home. Okay? So now I know. If the car breaks down or I lock my keys in the car, yep, done that several times. Okay? I've got now a layer of there to kind of take away some of that emotional response. Um, things like having an emergency fund. It's called savings. Have you all heard of that before? Our culture today doesn't know anything about that. Okay? You get what you get, you spend, or you got those nice cards, right? You can just load them up. But when you have got an emergency fund, just a, and I'm not talking a ton of money, but you got enough to cover that emergency expense, it takes a way of layer, a layer of just re overreacting. What am I going to do now? Why is life so bad? Guess what? All of our cars break down, and they will if you drive it long enough. The appliances are going to what? Go out. They're going to break down. So just know that and have some objective supportive evidence. Uh, remember, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you react. Paul and Acts, he kept praying, God, I want to go to Rome. Uh, please, God, open a door for me to go preach the gospel there. Well, God got him there, but it wasn't exactly the way Paul thought he was going to get there. He got there by being arrested and being put into a prison in Rome, chained to guards. Now, he wanted to preach the gospel to the emperor, and guess what? He got to preach the gospel to the emperor because the guards he was chained to, was a, they were a captive audience. <laughs> okay, And he spoke to them, and the gospel, we're told, went to Caesar's household. How do you think it got there? Word started spreading. There's this guy in jail. He is explaining things to us we've never heard before. There's this good news message about a, a man, Jesus, who came to this earth, the God-man. So Paul was able to reframe what he was going through. Here's something Paul could have written. Now, you're not going to find this in your Bible, but I thought this might be kind of fun to write down. Um, now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters in Christ, that life stinks. I wanted to spread the good news to the government officials in Rome, but that didn't happen. I've been shipwrecked and beaten, and I can't catch a break with all the Jewish radicals coming at me and wanting me dead. I don't get God. I have come to the conclusion that prayer does not work. I'm giving up on the church, and you won't be hearing from me again. <laughs> what if Paul would have wrote that to the Philippians, okay? But here's what he did write to the Philippians. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, and by the way, Paul is in jail, we think, in Rome when he writes this letter, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Is that not incredible? What a perfect example as we conclude today of a life situation that happens, of being able to recognize the possibility of a bias, but then reframing that situation and giving God the glory. So we've talked about three tools to help us over the last seven weeks. Number one, we talked about the replacement principle. That is replacing the lie with truth. Number two, we talked about rewiring your brain. Remember we talked about how the brain works and that the brain is actually capable of rewiring itself. And we need to do that by, to, in order to renew the mind. And then today we talked about reframing, reframing your mind, restoring your perspective. Um, next week, I'm going to deviate just a little bit. Tommy and I are going to do a sermon together and talk about a new um, missional opportunity that God's put before us. I'm really excited for us to share that together. And then I'll come back and do a couple more lessons as we wrap up the Renewing the Mind. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time together today. 
Lord, thank you for your word and just how practical it is and for all these examples we have of men and women who, who were not perfect, who struggled as we struggle, but give us help in living out our lives for you. Thank you, Lord. Bless us as we go from here now. In Jesus we pray, amen. This morning, the invitation is open. Come if you need to. Let's stand and sing together. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky. here. Have a great day, everybody. Blessings.